Hello. The following reflection is inspired by the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Usually, in times of crisis, personality traits are exacerbated. For example, those who always like to be in control have probably reorganized during the last weeks the, their spice cabinet alphabetically. Among those who protest on the news against the restriction and confinement imposed to protect the most vulnerable of our society, you will most likely find individuals who tend to be selfish. People who are anxious by nature are buying more stuff, more toilet paper, more flour, more Lysol, because of their fear of not having enough resources to survive this pandemic. In these unsettling and disorganized times, the true nature of someone or even a community is revealed in plain sight. Today's reading from the Book of the Acts of Apostles is offering an interesting glimpse of the very early Christian movement. And at this specific point, uh, the moment of the reading, the disciples were facing a moment of crisis. Christ has died, risen, and went back to God. And they were now forced to reorganize and reinvent themselves because they could not continue their work as if Jesus was still among them. They had no choice to live their faith differently. And since their existence was changed dramatically with, by the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the, desi the disciples desired to embody this transformation through their lifestyle, decision-making, and behaviors. The disciples organized a fellowship based on the sense of sharing and mutuality. Together they worship, they pray, they taught, they learn every day. And they broke bread and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, the text says. Something we kept and I believe perfected in our congregation these days because men will love to eat together. Sometimes I said without food there would be no united church at all. But back to the book of the Acts. This text also tells us something else about the first Christian community in Jerusalem. In verse 44 and 45, we can read the following. All who believe were together and add all things in common. They will sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as, as any add need. Hmm. Commentators and biblical analysts do not agree about the historical accuracy of this statement. Some would say that the disciple may have adopted this radical lifestyle. Across history, we have witnessed many revolutionary movements that restructured their society around the welfare of the collectivity. And this utopian community probably worked for a while when they were still a fairly small group before growth and institutionalization changed everything. On the other end, others simply see in these words uh, an exaggeration or an ideal they were not really able to achieve. And this view is principally popular among American authors who probably struggle to believe that the first uh, Christian were just a bunch of socialists, like God forbids. <sighs> Furthermore, since Jesus' disciples were essentially poor, they say, well, they wonder where the money did come after a while. However, regardless of their opinions, 
almost everyone stresses this lifestyle could not work for us today. We live in a different world, with different economic systems, larger population, different problems and challenges, and so on and on. It would be impossible to sell our position and goods and have everything in common and share resources with those who need it the most. We are told that there will not be enough resources to take care of everyone. Yeah, we're told this. Our society constantly proclaimed that we never have enough. The whole advertisement business is based on our human desire to possess more. More money, more clothes, more jewelry. We're told to be truly happy. We ought to buy the latest iPhone, a bigger car, or timeshare in the South. Politicians and corporations tell us that we ought to create more wealth and goods. Rich and poor people are always fighting about who should control the resources at our disposal. And yet, in all those statesmen and debates, we are always never asked what is enough? What do we really need to be happy? What does our community require to thrive? Hmm. We're rarely told that there's sufficient food on this planet to feed everyone. And if approximately 9 million men, women and children die of starvation every year, it is solely due to our inability to share with one another. Our desire to hoard and protect our resource at all cost comes from our struggle to believe that there is already enough for all. We struggle. We struggle even if Jesus taught us otherwise. The one who came to reveal the presence, the glory of God in the whole universe, from the subatomic particles to cosmic swirls, and thus invite us to trust and live in a spirit of abundance. Time, time and again, he went against the logic and the normalcy of the surrounding world, and he advocated for the redistribution of resources. He gave us this counterintuitive advice that the more we give, the richer the people in our community can be. And he has shown to his disciples and the large crowds that there's always enough fish and loaves of bread to feed everyone. Now Jesus had called us to live a life of, I would say, enoughness. And yet, because we live in a culture that values self-sufficiency and independence, we tend to approach our lives as a journey filled with dangerous booby traps. Most of us have no desire to live like the first disciples because we're afraid of what me might be just around the corner. Oh, we prefer to keep our positions for our rainy days. And when it begins to pour, well, we're trying to find other ways, other reasons to continue on the same path. Yeah. But we are called to be the church by following in Jesus' footsteps. We are asked to discover how generous generosity can change our individual and collective lives. We are challenged to discover the joy of sharing the goods that have been given to us without expecting much in return, and hoping that others will do the same and our community will be enriched by these decisions. 
We are called to a lifestyle that go beyond the walls of our churches, the structures of our institution, and to make sure that all our ministries would be impacted by a sense of hope, renewal, love. And don't get me wrong here. I'm not advocating for the return of the 1960s, the flower power, and the reopening of communes. No. This life of generosity can be embodied in the choices and action we all do in our current existence. Because every one of us has something to share. It can be money, gifts, talent, time, experience, wisdom, and so on. And, and the gestures we can do are, do not have to be spectacular. Maybe it, uh, it can begin with this tool in your garage that hasn't moved for the last 10 years. Hmm? And by giving it to someone else who really needs it, you can begin to transform the lives of others in our community. Even the smallest action can have an impact in ways sometimes we cannot imagine and improve the existence of individuals we will never meet in our lives. Each time we do not take more than required. Each time we base our decision or vote on the greater needs of our collectivity. Each time we prioritize the welfare of the vulnerable in our society. Well, we express the best version of ourselves. Our faith stopped being a series of theories and dogma and we have a real positive impact in the lives of the people in the real world. We'll never know. We'll never know if the first disciple really share all their position with one another. But honestly, does it matter for us today? Because like them, we, we are called by God to be a sign of God's love and compassion in the world. And we cannot achieve this by keeping all our gifts, our talent, our resources to ourselves. In moments of crisis, as well as in ordinary times, we are asked to reveal the essence of our self, of our faith of our spirituality, even if it goes against the logic of our world. We are invited to be the best version of ourselves. We are invited to explore the joy of sharing with one another and discover how it can profoundly change ourselves and our world. Thank you for being there. Thank you for God and Amen.